minutes, February 1st, 2016, public session. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Oh, motion by Penny, second by Joel. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. February 1st, 2016, non public session one. So moved. Motion by Penny, second by Joe. Discussion? Can I ask that you seal those? That's what we, yes. Okay. Uh, session, I thought it was session one, but let me. No, actually, I thought it was session two. Yeah, it's session two. It's session two. two. Yeah. Sorry. yeah I'm okay. Notes for okay, hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Are we going to seal this? No. No. Session, session two, the next one. Oh, all right. Um, February 1st, 2016, non public session, two minutes. So moved. Motion to approve by Penny, second by. Joe nodded. No, Joe? Okay. <laughs> well, nobody else wants. Discussion on these minutes? We have to see them in public. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I guess I had. We have to approve them and then. Approve them and then seal them? Yes. Okay, so do you have any. Any errors or missions? Yeah. I just had a question and I can't okay. ask it non public. All right, do you want to put these off? No, I can approve them without putting them off. Okay. So all in favor of approving these minutes? Aye. Aye. Motion okay. to seal for five years. Well, now public session two. Yeah, I thought. Yeah. You think longer? No. I, no. Oh. I was thinking like a year. You, matter of fact, if the next board decides that they want to unseal them, they can. So I mean, it's, you doesn't can't. Really matter, so five okay, so motion is seal for how many, Joe? Would, are you comfortable with two? I would two. seal them two. until June 30th of 2016. Okay, that's perfect. That's okay. okay. Second. All in favor? <coughs> right. <coughs> professional Development Committee. I just um, wanted an update on the Professional Development Committee, um, what's going on with it. Um, I wasn't even sure who on our board was a member of that committee. It hasn't done anything. I was going to say, yeah, um, I think we need to had visit some that. time getting, in fact, there's still one school that I don't have names of a rep for. And so once I realized I may not have anybody coming forward from that school, we may just meet and say anybody from that school has to work through a rep from one of the other schools for their recertification. Um, and then things that have gone on have been things that have gone on and that's fallen to a back burner. Okay. So I have to apologize on that piece. Um, we have not met. All right. So that my other question then is... So we um, are working <coughs> on the early release day and also uh, the April day. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I can. Um, so for the April 1st day, uh, we gathered some information from uh, teachers mostly at um, Henry, Henry Wilson and the high school because they're the ones that aren't doing parent teacher conferences because Valley View is for a portion of the day. Um, we'll have a day start with de-escalation strategies from a presenter who's been here before who was enjoyed a great deal had a lot of unsolicited comments that they really enjoyed his work. Um, have had recommendations to have work done with rubrics especially getting ready for accreditation so that's something I'm getting people to to um, kind of give me proposals of what they're going to do in terms of talking to contractors um, co-teaching differentiated instruction um, school safety was another one that was mentioned um, smart board training um, these are kind of broken up so that the first hour everybody is all together and then there's two hour section for therapeutic crisis intervention training those of you that are trained you need to go to that <coughs> Alex um, so that they can be recertified. Um, this is to keep compliance with um, Senate Bill 396 for seclusion and restraint. Um, but other people are welcome to attend as well. Um, it will be a two-hour block for co-teaching, a two-hour block for differentiated <coughs> instruction, two hour block, two two-hour blocks for the rubrics piece so that people can kind of choose where they want to spend 
their two hours. Um, still working on getting, you know, a, f a few more. We'd had, you know, suggestions of brain-based learning, so I'm looking to try and get those. Um, like I said, smart boards, but there are <coughs> people that are being trained on smart boards, so they will be able to provide, that is my hope, um, some instruction related to that. Um, spoken to Katie Gray about the possibility of her doing one of her presentations that she's done before, so that's, that's kind of how the day is, is going to look at this point. Do the pairs participate in this? Yeah, they do. Yep. yep. So until until they're until they're you know at whatever point they're released during the day, I've tried to keep that in mind so that they won't run yeah, into a spot. Yeah, because I was just wondering about miss. what is relevant for them. To de-escalation strategies. Yeah, I can is see the de-escalation, but I was wondering about co-teaching differentiated also. instruction. Differentiated would, instruction would be. I mean, especially yeah. if there are times when they're sitting yeah, in classrooms, smart, smart boards. boards. Too, but um, co-teaching because you know depending on the situation and the level of expertise <coughs> there can be situations depending where on what they do in the classroom sure yeah. okay great I have a question on differentiated instruction yes sir. House Bill 218 yes we killed it in committee we did. Be, and that was because well because can you please tell me what House Bill 218 is House Bill 218 uh, allows what would have allowed a stipend for the school district to collect six hundred and seventy five dollars for kids that do not make proficient or above mm. for the mathematics test, I believe. It was it's either math or I I'd have to don't nail me, it's one or the other. Yeah. So <clears throat> but and it's three hundred and nine thousand dollars across the state. But it got killed in committee. And and the reason why and one of the reasons we <coughs> used was differentiated education because you can target there's only a couple of kids mm -hmm. in, that fit that category. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is that well? I mean, the thing that you need to keep in mind in terms of, especially in regards to this school, we have one diploma. So regardless of differentiated instruction, there is still a, a you know minimum requirement that every student has to make meet in terms of having you know mate marked proficient in terms of receiving a high school diploma from here. We do have some services in place to try to address that for those students that are, you know, exceptionally exceptional and, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. How how difficult is that for the district to meet that need for those few students? I think we had five students total that for for both categories, math and uh, language arts. Who didn't what? Well how much of a, a problem is it for our district? Is the question is if the students don't make to, to differentiate that education of those <coughs> well, I mean it depends it, de it, de it depends mm, what, we have a life skills program for those students who require really what's what's considered to be a really separate stream in terms of curriculum um, we also have you know you have your, your honors classes you have your your CP classes or your college preparation classes and then kind of your basic classes so within each one of those classes there are students at, at different levels um, it takes time. I mean, I, that's, I guess, is my, my best answer. It takes collabor you know, some time to collaborate with the other teachers that might be involved in your classroom. Um, so I, I don't want to say it's a problem. I'd say it's a challenge in terms of being able to meet you know, the needs of every student in every class. Thank you. Exceptional in either end of the spectrum. Gotcha. Does anybody else have any questions on the professional development piece? OK. Thank you, ladies. Buildings and grants. Oh, 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 okay. Buildings and grants. Oh, we, d we were doing professional development. I thought we were doing special aid. Man, you no, jumped no, ahead. No, you jumped ahead. ahead. We jumped ahead. Okay. Oh, yeah, oh, you did jump ahead. I, did. Oh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't think I was losing it. All right. Which I may be. So, do we have an update on buildings and grants? We, that was just thought. I just put it we on don't here. Have for, okay. We were going to meet last week, but there was a snow day. We're going to meet today. We were going to meet today, but with three meetings, it were potentially scheduled it was one too many okay <coughs> so we're coming together for another meeting at another point okay. yes I'd just like to commend both Bonnie and Larry for this weekend <coughs> certainly this was a test of our uh, buses and a test of uh, our buildings and I know that Larry was around on Saturday checking making sure we were tight and not leaking Thank you, Larry. Um, you know, unlike some other districts I know. <coughs> so I greatly appreciate their commitment, and the same was with the buses yesterday uh, on a Sunday. They yeah. were getting them sure. started, um, which didn't go easily, but 
they did get them set for this morning. So I appreciate both the commitment of our administrators in that program. Thank you. Hopefully Thank I'm you. Better my tractor did. <coughs> my new tractor. Okay, so okay, <laughs> special education, educational yeah, information. Yeah, that's a, that's a terrible description, and I yeah. apologize for that. <laughs> That's okay. God. So there've been a lot. There've been a lot of questions, a lot of discussion about special education services and you know where it may cuts. And I understand that, and I want to I want to honor that discussion um, by providing some information um, so that we, we all can kind of operate from the same spot. Shonda Tifa is also going to be coming <coughs> out with the high school part. So these are some stats <coughs> regarding students coming into the district. So Valley View. Um, to, this is for this current school <coughs> we've had 54 students arrive new into the district and I've tried this is only Farmington this is not Middleton uh, I've tried to also pull out of there any of those students that kind of come in leave and come back um, I, I believe I've, I've gotten all of them so as of February 11 2016 you saw 47 of those students um, those remaining students with special education needs there's nine in Valley View right now and so the percentage of new students with services is about about 19 there. Last year for them, the total of new students, and this is again just Farmington students, I've pulled all of Millerson out, um, was 84. Those that remained, going through power school and checking to see if <coughs> these kids still with us, 56. Of the 56, 15 had special education services or need. Variety of, of disabilities, variety of level of needs in terms of intensity or not. Some were, were quite intense. Some were just if you want to call it standard, standard special education students. So that gets to about 27% of that population. Henry Wilson, <coughs> and this is for 2014-2015. We had 46 students arrive. 29 of them stayed. Nine of those were students with special education needs to give us about a 31% of those that stay. So I'm figuring from those that stay. Excuse me, when you yes. say 46 arrived new to the district. New to the district. Okay. Okay, or students that came, that maybe have been here before, but yeah. have been gone for a yeah. while, so they are new to the district. Uh, total that arrived in 2015, 2016, 39. Staying power this time in terms of Henry Wilson. Um, 34, those that remain, only eight have special education needs. A couple of them were, you know, pretty difficult kids and some we're still getting a sense of you know how involved they're going to be but that's about 24 percent high school I only had one year um, 22 have arrived this year <coughs> 19 have remained and seven have special education services connected with them that came to us this doesn't count <coughs> two students that had been out of district and wound up coming to us by virtue of the fact that their parents moved to our district um, and that we always talk about having a placement here, but sometimes it's not, not possible, and that was the case here. So Valley View Community School, to kind of dip, you know, kind of step out what we have there. We have a pre-K coordinator, and this is a .5 position. It's grant funded, and the same individual teaches for half of the day for preschool. And then I kind of give you a kind of a, a explanation of what she does. I've also put this, I've also shared it with you, so if you want to go back to it and you have questions later, please do let me know. So when kids come into our district as two-year-olds, they're referred for early, um, early services and supports, usually through community partners. This individual receives the referral, which requires usually a couple of meetings. One with the early supports and services people, can, oftentimes includes a home visit. Um, data needs to be tracked in terms of, you know, I'm trying to remember the name right now, um, but preschool outcomes in terms of you know because the state requires that on that and that's part of one of the indicators that we have to um, report to that's 
all of these indicators here that in terms of <coughs> compliance when the state calls up and asks us to have you know you need x y and z this person is responsible for all of, all of that you know the composition of the IEPs any progress reports um, and half the day she teaches um, and then also could do visits to Head Start because once a kid is identified as as needing special education services even if they don't join our school we're still responsible for providing those services so whether they decide to come to our preschool or if they're go you know parents have chosen we want to go somewhere else we still need to talk about how those services are going to occur we can't kind of say oh they're over at preschool somewhere else so that's her job she has currently 16 students so I've kind of taken kindergarten through grade three to try to give you a, a picture of what goes on there so four hours and 30 minutes I asked everybody to give me their schedules and I went through and kind of delineated all right this is how much time we have assigned to one either if you're doing tier three instruction which is usually a pull out service um, morning meetings students check-ins um, it looks a little bit different Rebecca <coughs> feel free to jump in at any time and you've got these younger kiddos um, and that's part of the reason we built I think I built in the transition times between classes because for the little children especially the preschoolers even that time is really kind of a learning time especially for um, students that have you know really deep sensory needs or speech language issues talking about getting from one direction one place to another talking about going up and going down um, all of those pieces are, it's, it, it's if any of you have ever tried to hurt a group of really young kids as you know moving from one location to another isn't always the easiest thing so there is a transition built in between different activities um, and I kind of delineate their kind of how their their day is structured caseloads look like 12 to 21 students depending on the grade and then these are the other duties and you'll see a repetition of some of this because a lot of it is common to other special education teachers as well um, you know the requirement to modify assessments that maybe the regular classroom teacher has has not modified or there's certain things that this particular student needs um, perhaps a, a separate setting which would be the responsibility of the special education teacher to take care of update to parents um, younger kids you know parents want to know a little more readily in terms of how their day went so case managers have to email daily or communicate daily or you know weekly or monthly it all depends um, progress monitoring sensory breaks as needed occasionally we do have a person that deals with that specifically um, for a certain group of students but that doesn't eliminate the need for case managers to have to do it at times um, and we'll talk about I'll talk a little bit about what a sensory break is as well Diana yeah. can I interrupt you for a sure. second nobody can hear you at home if you're not <gasps> I yeah phone so phone. I was thinking so can you so grab sorry. a mic and walk with it sure. you look comfortable doing that and I, and I, will I didn't want to break your mojo but no that's why I'm so sorry I'm glad you mentioned it um, yeah all right I have dreams of this um <laughs> <laughs> she breaks out in song yeah no you don't want that to no i'm sorry uh, yeah. um, so good. social skills instruction especially for the very young kids um is particularly important because they're you know so everybody comes to us with a different different level of need a different level of understanding so whole idea is to meet them where they are and then of course progress them toward grade level especially with spe social skills um this can be challenging write IEPs progress reports IEPs kind of a run-of-the-mill one and anybody can jump in here you know some of the material you can keep you know from one year to the next but usually most of it needs to or I would recommend it's you know entirely revamped and all of the present levels updated and everything else and those tend to run a short one I want to say 14 pages and shake your head if I'm wrong guys but a typical one would be 14 pages and of course you can have some that are longer it all depends Say, say it again 17 to 20 is more accurate 17 to 20 okay um, so behavioral <coughs> assistance teacher and this is something um, I know we talked talked a little bit and we've kind of thrown around Toby which was um, a special education program we had with students who had emotional difficulties or kind of had the e emotional handicap coding um, that had been changed we didn't have a lot of kids that, just kind of a reluctance to code a kid and, and probably any kid with an emotional handicap at especially at that young age um, so the model got changed to having a behavior assistant teacher who can fill a role of providing sensory breaks for a lot of different kids and, and even kids who aren't special education students benefit from sensory breaks and any of us sitting here right now 
has taken any number of sensory breaks. You know, we've, we've twiddled our arms, we've tapped our foot, um, you know, we've stared off into space, um, you know, we repeated some kind of mantra in our head. All these different things are a sensory break. Unfortunately, our young kids um, often don't come to us with <coughs> a sense of how to regulate themselves emotionally. And, and we're seeing a greater increase, <coughs> I think, and in talking to a few schools as well, and having a need to have, you know, some kind of check-in with kids about this. Dover does a, and it sounds kind of silly, but it's it's good for the young kids. A start your engine morning, which is all about a sensory break and kind of getting that activity out of the way so they can get set to learn. And this kind of gives you um, a breakdown of what her day is like. She, for instance, um, can be on call in the morning. If we've got a little kiddo on the bus who doesn't want to come off the bus. Um, we sent her out and managed to convince the child to come in or to assist with the transition. Um, Can I ask you a question? Sure, yes. Is that a certified special ed teacher? She is, yep. I noticed it said 15 students access her. How many are assigned to her caseload? Um, there's only one assigned to her caseload in terms of her writing the IEP, but she has 15 students during the course of the day that she, <coughs> that she works with. Thank and you. And she does provide, I think, Tier 3, Rebecca, for, for reading. Um, for a couple of students, she provides some tier three interventions, and then most of the time she's dealing with those 15 students that, uh, as I said to, to Diana when we discussed this, you know, they're going to get to Henry Wilson, and many of them will probably be identified as emotionally, behaviorally um, disabled. But at this point, they're kind of on that cusp, and we're trying to work with them to teach them some of those new behaviors to. Um, be more successful. No, I, I would. And I, I guess I might just correct you. It probably wouldn't be 15 kids that would come out of there and be labeled as emotionally handicapped. No, our, our more, yeah. you know, our population of students that struggle yeah. more. Um, so a sensory break, and a lot of a lot of schools are embracing this. And I've seen some studies in terms of schools like there was a school in Texas. Um, one of our OT people, Taryn Quinn, pointed out to me that had breaks during the course of the day for about you know, 10, 15 minutes where kids took come, some kind of motor break, something to kind of be active. Because um, we do do, and if you've been in a classroom recently, even with a second grader, there's a lot of sitting. Um, and that's, that's a lot of time for a kid to, to stay still and stay concentrated. And so what this does is just really give us a chance to reset. And we all do it, whether we chew gum or tap a pen or doodle. Um, those are sensory breaks. But for a kid that, that doesn't really know what he or she needs, need some help with that and so that's where the sensory menu comes in so when a student accesses this room there's there's always <coughs> set up for each child a list of things that he or she can choose from based on what's best for the kid and what's proven to work whether it's fine motor or it's you know gross motor where you need to do some you know maybe dragging some things around or doing some kind of heavy lifting um, she has seen a, you know, that the students have been able to kind of, because it's all about building stamina. <coughs> We're working about on building stamina for students to remain in the classroom. And that's, that's the biggest role, I think, that she fills. Can I ask one more question? Yes, absolutely. Does this individual have some type of specialized training above and beyond a general ed, special ed? Cert? Yeah, she has. She used to work. Where, where, where did she come to us from? I want to say, um, it was, like a, it was like a monarch school um, where she, that's what she did. She worked with, with students on the spectrum. She worked with students with behavioral needs. So she's had, um, I want to say, two years of work in that area, at least one, um, and also working to develop behavior plans. So that's, that was why she was, was kind of chosen as the person who would be able to fill that role. And I can find out some more for you, too, if that would be helpful. So Henry Wilson. So grades four through six, and, and each end of the building looks a little bit different. Um, Check-ins in the morning, um, some students need them, some students are just fine, but uh, students, oftentimes, students with special education needs need to have a check-in. Do you have this, do you have that? And, and sometimes just someone to touch base with and be like, oh, okay, Mrs. Mrs. Hill is here today. That's, my day's gonna be okay. <laughs> um, they do do um, small group instruction in terms of <coughs> pull out or a push in model. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next page. Co teaching for science and social studies um, for grade five, where they come together and, on, and I can let Elizabeth speak to this a little bit and on their own time kind of make a plan for here's what we're gonna do. This is the, the activity. I think there was a some experiment with an egg in a bottle, if I'm not mistaken, that they did for science. And that was prepared together with the idea that all students would be able to ac access that particular activity. Um, preparations, call and salt time, in terms of to meet with regular education teachers to check in on special education teachers. 
um, lunch and duty. <coughs> and then you see the caseloads down there. So a lot of time mostly just spent in, in the classroom. And then again, this is gonna be a, look a little repetitive in terms of the last, the last piece. Um, you know, behavior assistance as needed. Sometimes uh, a regular education teacher will ask a special education teacher, can you come in and just look at this kid for a little while and you know, tell, tell me what's going on. And sometimes that leads, leads to the <coughs> student assistance team. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's simply you know, something that can be checked. Um, again, communication with parents is, is pretty important. Also, at this age, not Rebecca kind of handles this at Valley View, but we get more into kind of contact with the outside um, community <coughs> partners, if there's counseling, um, DCYF, if there's, you know, a foster family involved, or some kind of, you know, greater court involvement. And then if it really spills over to where it's, you know, pretty serious, then that's usually where I, I get to go to the court dates. Uh, modifications to lessons and assignments as needed. And then seven and eight, because it's, you know, kind of really broken down by period. It looks a little bit different. Um, they've got each, everybody has an advisory. Um, and then they're in classes or co-teaching um, for the rest of the day. Academic support in the regular education classrooms. Um, co-teaching, which I think is a, a great model to do. You know, pull out instruction when possible. Um, not a lot of, as, as we would call it, tier one and tier two <coughs> intervention we have right now, um, which is something we, you know, I think we'd like to have a conversation about. Modification of, of assignments as necessary. There's a structured study hall, which I think has really benefited um, the special education students in terms of being able to keep on track of the assignments and that if you, you know, kind of once you get behind, then it becomes the, the grind to try to get caught up. Um, team meetings and then you see the caseloads there. Are there only two? There are only seventh and eighth grade. So two case managers, two case managers. Yeah. Uh, can I ask another question? Yes, ta talk a little more about pull out instruction as necessary. So if there's an opera so for instance, and, and Laurel, you or Angela could could speak to this if you want to. So for instance, if there's been a math instructions for instance Angela's done a co teaching piece and she has um, you know, students that don't don't quite get it there can be an opportunity to pull them out, provided you can find the time to do it. Oftentimes, Angela winds up using that time um, during her study hall time to reteach the lesson. And Laurel, if there's a different scenario, you scenario, you I do the, the same thing during study hall, but like last year, my kids were low enough so that they wouldn't survive in the regular ed reading. I pulled them out and did a, a special ed reading class with six or seven kids. Yeah, and I think... A separate reading all together. Yeah. And I think the... Um, what you're going to see next is kind of what's begun to help us handle this a lot, um, which I'm really <coughs> thrilled about. Um, not the positive behavior lab. I wanted to go to life skills, but positive behavior lab over here. Um, classroom, in the classroom for support, for four hours and 50 minutes again. There is a homeroom. There is a study hall. Um, again, there's a time for planning. Uh, consultations that occur, setting up IEPs, tracking, tracking student data in particular and related to um, behaviors. And that's been kind of important for a couple of meetings that we've had with teachers to kind of look at the days that a student had escalated behavior and kind of be able to correlate it with what might have been going on in the classroom or what might have been going on at home. Um, consultations with, out, again, outside sources because that becomes more involved. Um, here we have a caseload of four, but one of those students is transitioning or graduating from this program and will become part of the seventh grade program. I have, I have another question. Yes, sure. Um, <clears throat> of these four students, mm -hmm. Were they placed by an internal decision? Did some were some of them pulled <coughs> back from out of district placements? What's the what's the makeup? Right, there aren't any here that are pulled back from an out of district placement at this point. Although we've had some <coughs> kids come back from out of district placement, it hasn't been to to Henry Wilson. Okay. Um, this is kind of the last stop we hope before we go to an out of district placement. Um, and can you give me the rest of that question? I don't think well, I just, I, I, it, it sort of answered it. I asked okay. if we, so we basically, these four students were identified internally Correct. as it, needing this service. It's a, it's a team yeah. decision, yep. Okay. I got a question if you would. Say it again. <clears throat> but you're, you've, you've assessed them first before you put them there. Correct? Yes. Okay, Joe had a question too. Sure. Sorry, Diane. No, I have heard the question. Okay, so sorry. I'll come, I'll come we'll back. We'll come back. All right, thank you. Here's life skills. Um, oh, I, I, had, I got go the ahead. question. Okay. What, what do we do to train the parents? What, how do we, you know, we, we've got a behavior problem. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, a lot of these problems can be <coughs> traced to the parents, family, family life, or, or they just can't handle it. What are, what are we doing for them? Um, to so correct this? right. So what we've been encouraging. Um, pretty strongly and trying to make make sure we do everything we can to kind of encourage this connection is to get a connection with community <coughs> partners because they have in-home support services that that people can access now unfortunately um, the waiting list can be very long so we often have tried to encourage it before we get to this point um, but that's a lot of a lot of the conversations that we have and that I know the names of those people at community partners that are connected with some very specific students that we have um, and that's also part of you know part of what I do part of what life skills does part of what um, you know PPL also does is, is also keeping in touch with those counselors that are connected with those children through community services so getting parents help that way um, the other part of that, which is coming up, and it's not the one that we're going to do <coughs> immediately, but we're doing some parent workshops, or at least Matt can maybe speak to this more. Um, Emily Pirro, who's our social worker, has been having parent support groups where parents come in and they kind of talk about, you know, it, it, can be a, it can be a venting session. It can also be kind of, it's also been constructive as well for parents to come in and talk about here are the challenges of raising my kids. Um, and Emily, you know, kind of talks about the teenage boy. <coughs> okay, here's what here's what's going on with the kid when he or she says no about X, Y, and Z. Um, so that started. We also have a parent workshop that's coming up March 9th. This is specifically related to um, risky <coughs> behavior um, in terms of in specifically related to drugs, um, students that might be engaged in, in, in physical, you know, kind of cutting or self-mutilation because they're experiencing it's anxiety. Town meeting night. It's town meeting night, isn't it? It's Is town, it town meeting, meeting night. night. Yep. <coughs> no. Yeah. All right. So maybe it won't be March 9th. Let me double check. <laughs> Let me go back and look again. I just thought I'd put that on No, there. I appreciate it. Because, you know. yep. Yep. Yeah, we're trying to see. I thought I had the perfect date. Maybe I don't. But anyway, <coughs> this is um, Melissa Fernald, who's a certified social worker, also a counselor, who has created this kind of great scene where it's a bedroom scene and parents can come in and kind of take a look but there are 80 pieces of evidence in there somewhere hidden that a child is engaged in some kind of risky behavior she brings the parents in they have this conversation they talk about kind of what are the what's the new picture of students who are involved in, in risky <coughs> behavior how does this look now um, and so that's the presentation that's coming I think <coughs> because you know community kind of needs it and you know I've been to plenty of court cases where we've got mm -hmm. issues of where you know Grandparents say, oh, I never knew my, right. my child who has a right. child who's engaged in this. So that's kind of what we're doing, Joe. It's a long answer to probably. I actually have two more questions, questions about sure. the PBL. Um, does it require, does the individual who's the case manager, are they required to have some type of specialized certification, or is it a general special ed cert? He has a general special education cert, um, mm -hmm. but we do look for individuals that have have had experience working in a behavior situation, you know, some kind of situation where it requires having some you know sophistication about using behavioral approaches this particular individual had worked in a residential setting mm -hmm. um, had also worked in Lawrence Mass regarding being a case manager um, and the, the second question is are there any pairs assigned to the program there are so pairs assigned to the program yes there's there are three right now three pairs to the four kids. for four kids yes mm-hmm I'll, I'll, I will address that. <laughs> Believe me. Oh, I didn't want to skip that one. My apologies. Um, let me go back for a moment. Because this is one. Oh, are you kidding me? No, no, no. Um, so life skills, and I apologize. I might have to go through this one. Um, perfect. So the life skills um, <coughs> class, which I'm uh, help. <laughs> and I think if you hit the red button on the remote, it will find your source. No, will it? Thank you. I apologize. Um, can you put on full screen? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what it looked like before. 
So anyways, um, life skills. Um, really thrilled about the work that's been done with the life skills program at Henry Wilson. And I don't know what he just did here, but that's not what I want. Um, she has done an amazing job at Henry Wilson in terms of coming up with themes that go specifically to <coughs> activities of daily living and, and incorporating that with reading, incorporating that with writing and math. Um, and it's, it's, she's got a small group of kids, so if you've walked into her room, you might say, um, you know, why are there so few kids there? There's a reason there are so few kids there. Um, these are our students that, that are most, um, you know, profoundly impacted by special education um, disability. Uh, she <coughs> spends four hours a day just doing direct instruction, reading, math, activities. Uh, they do a sensory activity every day, oftentimes going to the gym or something else that's connected to that. Um, she has a lunch social group where they just practice having a conversation. Um, and for a lot of these kids, that's, that's really important to know how to navigate and, and come up, you know, and sometimes it's, it's a little more scripted and you, these might be the kids in the hall that always come up and, you know, and ask you the same question. Um, but that's kind of, that's her work of having them, you know, have a routine. Um, this is students in the regular education classroom. She's also, you know, modifying materials, creating new materials so that those students can access because they're not just in this one class so that they can also access the other classes, um, <coughs> you know, to, the, to an ability, to a to level that makes sense. All of these are connected with a theme. There's usually an activity and some kind of community visit that goes along with this. They've been to the fire department um, and they have other activities planned as well. And I apologize, I'm forgetting all the places that they've gone. But they've done Toys for Tots. I mean, she's just really had a great enriching program. She creates a newsletter that she sends home um, for the parents. And it's really been, a, I think, an excellent, excellent program. These are additional um, duties. She addresses behavior, she addresses safety concerns because you know, for some of these children, you know, <laughs> you might say, oh, I just met some new friend on the internet. And you know, that's something that she would you know, quickly tag and say, okay, um, this is, you know, let me explain to you X, Y, and Z. Um, lots of communication with parents um, just because it's an issue of safety for some of these kids. Um, consults with regular education teachers just as you would <coughs> see with the other people, special, you know, also with the um, OTPT related services. Also updates parents regarding school activities, which is an important thing because sometimes those get missed. Question. Yes, sir. <coughs> Gifted kids, what do we do for them? Well, I mean, I think that's something we need to discuss. And I think when we look at, um, you know, we have a meeting coming up with the staff at Henry Wilson, the senior, more senior special education teachers to discuss revamping, you know, because I think there's, there's an area there to to trim and revamping this and talking about you know what is what are those services going to look like for next year? Wouldn't that fall into the differentiated instruction? Yeah, absolutely. Piece of that? Uh, it does. Um, you know, and that's also a place to spark, which is part of the reason we want to you know begin to have that that conversation as well. Um, you know, so in terms of looking at restructuring, you know, I think where I personally see it happening is at, at Henry Wilson. Um, in terms of what it looks like, that would be something that you know we'll discuss as a group and come up with as you know. What, what makes sense. So, so you see this year going forward as a rebuilding year. So starting at the bottom, taking the pool and making sure that we are using all the staff that we have to the best of our ability. Yeah, I mean, or what if, if we're not using it to the best of our ability, doing something about it. Absolutely. I mean, and I think the place we're going to start that conversation is Henry Wilson. Um, you know, and Sean is going to talk to you, I think, a little bit about, you know, what the high school is doing. And I'm, I'm honestly really excited about a lot of the things that are being done in the high school in terms of special education and, and services. Um, and so she's up next. But, yeah, I mean, the discussion the discussion starts at Henry Wilson, probably for some of the reasons that you've, you know, you've heard questions asked about. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. How, many, a question. Yes, how many students coming off of special ed in a little <coughs> say, s since the beginning of the year? Uh, I, I don't have that figure on the or top roughly, of my head. Roughly, I mean, we yeah. have 205 right now, and you've seen the numbers of how many you know special education students have come in, and you know, and that number is kind of holding steady. Um, you know, sometimes it's due to a move, sometimes it's it's due to the fact that the you know the child, and some in the elementary school have you know mastered mastered the. <coughs> and it's one thing to say too to keep in mind is that students will go off special education, and then sometimes come back on. I mean, they'll hit a point where developmentally they're ready for things and they're ready for challenges but you know as it becomes more difficult sometimes they wind it back on we do everything we can to avoid that because once somebody graduates we don't necessarily want to put them back on 
but I, I apologize I don't have that figure that would take that take a good deal of searching because our Nessus program doesn't really track that for us but I could try to find out for you well I mean because we're we're trying to call what you will rehabilitate these kids mm -hmm. or get them up to a certain level yep. and we spend all this money and we want to see that successful mm -hmm. maybe we need to be doing something else well I think that's, that's, that's <coughs> the conversations we're having I mean and I think that's you know a conversation Rebecca has in her building um, and it's a conversation Shonda has in, in her building with her special education teachers as well thank you y'all set John <laughs> I need the lights on. Kids. You do need the lights. Yes. Could you turn the lights on? Yeah. All right. I have a copy for everybody. If you want to take one of each, they're back to back, so you're gonna have to flip back and forth. But I figured you could write questions on the side if you need to. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Shonda Tebow. I'm the special ed coordinator here at the high school. Uh, so I tried to put together some um, of, of the more important things that you'd want to know. If you have questions, um, four of our five case managers are here tonight. We'd be happy to answer anything specific. Um, and everything on the PowerPoint is also in front of you. Um, so currently, we have 52 identified students in the high school. Um, Seven of those 52 moved into this district this year. So the numbers are very fluid. Um, they came, you know, some came from Rochester, we had some come from Maine, Portsmouth, all over, but just this year, seven have been added um, into our, our caseload um, from other districts. Um, and they continually change. We currently have five case managers here at the high school. Um, we had six in the past. We did not replace that six case manager when we lost that case manager. Um, because we only lost six special ed students at the high school when Middleton uh, went with the Middleton move. So the current students we have was only, was only down by six. Um, we currently have six paraprofessionals. One of our paras is, is a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we have two additional para positions that we have not filled. So my responsibilities uh, vary, and you'll have to flip up, I'm sorry, there because they're back to back. Um, so I do all the scheduling for the special ed department. That includes putting all the students on a master schedule, looking at the master schedule to identify where the need is. If there, you know, I look at a class and I see, you know, there's eight special ed kids in this class, we have to make sure we're covering all of our service hours for our IEP. Um, I schedule all the paraprofessionals, all the special ed teachers on that master schedule. Um, coordinating all the duties for the paras and um, I do the para and the teacher observations uh, classroom observations I do attend out of district meetings so currently um, there are seven students so five of them are placed in out of district um, in a district facility that I actually write the IEP for them and then the additional two are students that are in out-of-district placements and I have to attend meetings. Um, where lot, sometimes they're on the phone, sometimes they're not. Um, so I do attend those meetings. Like I just attended a meeting in Summersworth the other day for one of our students. So it's a little confusing because five of them I actually am the case manager and write the IEP, but the additional two there um, are students that I actually have to attend meetings for also. <coughs> 
Um, the case management and IEP um, writing and training, um, I try to provide for all the case managers. Um, as we know, the DOE is continually changing. We get memos on a regular basis, and Diana sends them over to us, and um, we want to make sure that we're all in compliance. So that's an ongoing um, training with the case managers and, and paraeducators. No, sorry, not ready. Thought you were going <laughs> to flick. Um, I'm the LEA for all of the, um, the IEP meetings, all the progress meetings. Um, any of the eval meetings. I also go down to Henry Wilson to do the transition meetings for the eighth graders coming up to uh, for freshmen. Um, I do review all the draft IEPs. We send drafts home prior to meetings here um, at the high school, and I do review them um, prior to them going home. Um, Maplestone, that was the facility I was talking about um, where I'm writing IEPs for five of the students there. So in conjunction, obviously, with the, the special ed teachers there. Um, so coordinating services, we do a lot. Um, a high school IEP is really driven by transition. So transition is a huge part of the IEP. And the DOE um, is getting more and more complicated with the things we're expected to do. And part of that is um, making sure we're working with outside agencies like Stratford Learning Center, Voc Rehab, we spend a lot of our time, we have job developers that come in here, this whole process that takes takes place. I coordinate all that um, with the students and the outside agencies. Mm -hmm. Could yep. I, I just wanted to jump in for a minute. We had um, on-site review for indicator 13, which is just making sure that we have transition plans for students and that we're following them and that we're, you know, doing our due diligence and that was last year and we came, came yes. through very well on that review, so that happens. Yes, every five years, the DOE comes in and does an entire, they, they pull 10 of our files um, for transition. Um, let's see. So the behavior support room. So um, we had a behavior support room, um, which was in a, in, in a different classroom. Um, we did lose that case manager. I have now taken on the behavior support room. It's on the other side of my office, if you've ever gone into my office, you'll see there's another small room over there. It's a room that students, if they you know, need to leave the classroom, just need a few minutes to kind of unwind and then maybe go back or maybe we go and we make an appointment with guidance um, where they go to room 200 to, to, to meet with their case manager, but that's available for them um, and it is on the other <coughs> side of my office. Um, the in-school suspension, we have not come up with a plan yet for. I have been doing in-school suspension all year to this point. I've, um, been responsible for 27 students so far since the beginning of the school year. Um, that's just something extra I've taken on because we really don't know yet where we're going with that. Um, <coughs> I do all the monitoring of the Medicaid billing. Um, I run a report weekly to make sure paraprofessionals are um, making sure that they're billing correctly for the students that are billable through the Medicaid system. The new program we have is awesome. Oh, so much quicker. It's Good. wonderful. <laughs> Um, DOE, Diana just talked about that, the compliance, it's a huge piece. They do come in every five years and they do their audit for indicator 13, which is transition. Um, I've been through one my first year as the coordinator. Uh, we did very well um, and we work on a regular basis to make sure we're always in compliance um, with our IEPs. I have an awesome team back there and one missing and they, they do a phenomenal job with that. Uh, parent contact, so we really struggle. You know, I think sometimes special ed students get to the point of high school and parents think they're okay. Oh, they're older, they can handle that. Where it's, it's really difficult. I have to do all the certified mail because one of the compliance issues we have is in order, you have to show that you've tried three, <coughs> three times to contact a parent. One must be by certified mail. So those are some of the other, you know, things that, that um, I'm responsible for. Uh, meeting coordination, obviously, we have all the meetings in, in my office. Um, I'm the court liaison for the high school, um, so I do go to court on a regular basis for um, special ed and regular ed kids um, weekly, although this year it's been a little bit quieter, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, I support the athletic events after school, um, at games at night. Um, and then I also do staff presentations um, in regards to any of the special ed um, information at the high school. Okay. 
any questions? Should I ask questions? Not yet. <laughs> I, I, have, I have one. Yep. It, you said that you um, do teacher observations as the special ed. I do the in classroom observations for the special ed teachers and the paraprofessionals. Okay, but you don't. Ob do you observe the students or the teachers? Teachers, okay. teachers, yes, teachers and and the um, paraeducators. Okay. Yeah, while they're teaching. All right. Thank you. Okay, so you said you were writing some of the IEPs for the outside placements. What's the difference? Why why would you do it and not? It? Because this specific facility is not the, the way they are set up. They they do not write IEPs. Maybe Diana can talk so, about yeah. that. But yeah, yeah that just the difference facility. as to why we would as opposed to why they would. <coughs> so typically, typically, what happens is an out of district placement would do, write the IEP. Mm -hmm. This particular um, placement is in Maine, so they have a different different online system that they would use. And so, in, to kind of simplify life, we. have we've taken over creating that IEP so we can kind of keep track of it and management manage it um, as opposed to them trying to put it on their main information and then sending it over to us and then we cut and paste and put it into Nessus. I mean we could keep something that's very bare bones um, but I get I get kind of nervous when we have something in there that just says see file or see see IEP from somewhere else so we create the IEP for this particular placement. So I collect all the data from the, the teacher over there. Will send you know sends me all we I get all the information and we put it into I I actually put it into our Nessus so they will write a goal and, and send it to Shauna and Shauna can put it into our our system. Mm -hmm. Just you like you have another question. No, no, <laughs> I'm just wondering um, how does that work when you bill them? Are we billing them for your time? Or are they like? Discounting our this bill is, for us a, doing that. We no, do. We're doing saying. that because this is a particular. This is an incredibly cheap place. Yeah. Um, just and just that's, that's in the that is yeah, and that's yeah. the only reason we do because it because it seems like mm -hmm. you know we're we're paying her, but mm -hmm. we're sending them out that right. You know there would be no nope. you're mm -hmm. encompassing your job when we're paying someone else to do it. So. And the, yeah, no, and I, I absolutely understand the okay. question. This is an extremely cost-effective placement, yeah. and, and you know I can talk. Numbers with you. In well, I don't need to know the okay, particulars. I was just wondering and you know, what the difference would right. be, and, and that's the main right. reason why we're willing to. Okay. Be. If it were something much more expensive, we would certainly in something much more, you know, kind of detailed. Okay. Then, then we we certainly would be pushing back on that. Perfect. So I do have a question. Um, the the behavior support room on, only accessed by identified students. Um, at, you know, I've had mostly identified, but no, there are times when jet regular ed kids will come down, just need a quiet place, say that their guidance counselor's not available <coughs> at the moment. Um, so I've had regular Same ed kids Same question with ISS, I'm going to assume that's not just for identified students. Oh, no. no. And the AD at evening basketball games, what? It's kind of a standard practice when, when I was also the coordinator before is that we kind of split the duties between Matt and Kathy and, you know, whoever was the, you know, just so you, you can have some uh, someone present at the game um, to be kind of a point <coughs> person if something happened. Okay. That's all. Sorry. Anybody else? No. Um, anybody else? Okay. So the, the model that we follow, in, and Diana touched on this earlier, one of the big challenges we have at the high school is the fact that we have one diploma okay so we have students with with significant some of them significant cognitive needs um, in our life skills population and we have to find a way to modify the curriculum accommodate the curriculum for them to earn 26 the, the 21.5 credits so you're talking about possibly a student with a third grade ability having to take physical science biology all these courses that every student has to take because we only have one track that's a huge challenge at the high school huge huge challenge most schools have several different tracks for those real significant students but we don't we only have the one so it, it really it really does it, it, it makes it very difficult for the students um, to navigate. So the model anyway we follow is we have case managers who are scheduled in classrooms five to six periods a day. They accommodate, they modify for various needs, um, they collect data, and they, they work on assessments, they um, work with a teacher, obviously they're promoting you know positive cl uh, climate for learners, and they don't just work with special ed. 
you know, you're not going to see a special ed student uh, teacher in a classroom who's not going to answer the question of a regular ed kid or be walking around the room assisting everybody because that's, that's what they do. Um, we co-teach. So by the co-teaching, and I know Elizabeth's going to talk about it in a little bit, but it allows, the, it allows for the teacher to, you know, meet the needs of diverse learners. It allows for smaller grouping. So if you've got a special ed teacher and a regular ed teacher teaching together, you now have two small groups. And it's not special ed, regular ed. These are mixed groups where you get more instruction because of, because of the, the smaller numbers per um, teacher. Um, I've got a question. Yep. Right there. Life skills, how many kids in that category? Uh, right now, Alex has uh, seven students in his life skills program. You'll see, I think, on the next slide, Joe, um, I have some information on it. And that's going to increase next year because we have uh, a, a pretty big group coming up. Five, yeah. Mm -hmm. One may move, but we've got five for sure, which is going to bring us to 12, which is what we're supposed to be capped at in life skills. So um, we're going to have to definitely next year look at having more than one teacher in that classroom with that, that population. Good? OK. Um, so currently, um, we've got Mr. Chick. Dan Chick is co-teaching in physical science with Heidi Green. Joe Bellaconis teaches, uh, he co-teaches criminal law with Louise Leahy and military history with Aaron Murphy. Aaron Murphy. Um, Patty Beard teaches our life skills math class, and she also co-teaches many of the other math classes. Matt Bonin teaches the life skills English, and Alex um, Satterfield is um, supporting the students in the life skills with those outreach programs, the community programs that Diana was talking about that um, they're doing at the middle school. So they meet, um, <coughs> you know, the middle school and high school are meeting so that they, they're not both doing the same community activities. It's, you know, it's, it's a smooth transition. So um, he's, you know, he's bringing them out to the community to learn things like, how do you navigate the coast bus system? Because it's going to be really important for some of these kids to be able to get from point A to point B, um, you know, to get to work because they, they aren't going to have their license or they don't have the ability to be able to drive. Um, so each of them do a learning lab, and you should have the rubric. Um, it's a front and back rubric um, that I passed out for the learning lab. It's not in the staple part. It's the individual piece. That just kind of gives you an idea of um, our learning lab is the resource room. It's a structured um, I hate to call it a study hall because it's really not a study hall, but um, I guess you could say it's a structured study. Um, I think maybe a Zimbabwe there. Let me um, go around. I don't, oh, think, that's they went, it. I don't think they went all the way around. There. So it gives you an idea of how they break down the grades uh, because students do receive a quarter credit um, for the learning lab. Yeah, you can switch. So Learning Lab is, is the time that these students really, you know, rely on their case manager. It's time for case managers to be able to reteach some of those skills that these students didn't get um, in the classroom environment. So the case manager's responsibility, obvi obviously data collection. We're always collecting, collecting, collecting data in special ed. Um, IP writing, which again, our IEPs are about 17 pages long. It's about a 17-page legal document. Um, special ed progress reports, um, communication with parents and the transition specialists, um, monitoring the goals of their students, um, advocating for student needs um, throughout the classes. I mean, obviously, they can't follow their caseload around because they've got kids in seven classes seven periods a day, all different directions. Um, so it takes a lot of, coor a lot of um, coordinating. Um, so the credit monitoring, which again is so important in high school because high school is all about credit. Credit's all about diploma. Um, behavior supports, there, you know, our case managers are working on behavior supports with the students. Um, and one of the big challenges too is, as a case manager at the high school level is, you know, the ability to be able to work in multiple courses. You know, if you think of the last time you did biology or geometry or all these, you know, not only being, having to remember all those skills, but be able to differentiate <coughs> at all different levels, 9 through 12. And um, again, providing that co-teach model. <coughs> Just jump in real yeah. quick. I mean, the co-teaching model, um, we're relatively new to the process right now, and we're, we're growing as a group. Um, but
but it's been a cultural shift. When, when you think about traditional high school, uh, most teachers go in and it's their classroom and they want to take care of business their way and things like that. They're, they're opening their door, they're allowing another person to come in and really sort of step back in some cases um, when it comes to lessons and things like that and, and listening to other ideas of how to present that, that material. Again, I, these guys are sort of learning themselves how to look through those pieces of it, but then how, to, how do they go ahead and forward that in terms of what a special ed kid may need in order to truly understand those particular concepts. So uh, they should be commended, the, the special ed group, as well as those teachers willing to, to try this, uh, should be commended for their efforts in it because it's not normal that a lot of people would do this. And, and with the co-teaching, another challenge we have is our it's not in our <coughs> schedule for us to have um, common plan periods. So you're co-teaching with a teacher, and they're having to find the time before or after school, however they do it, to, to plan together because we just we don't have it in our it just doesn't work in our schedule to have you know them be able to have a common plan period, which is so common with a co-teach model. But they're making it work. <laughs> So our student needs, you know, we have emotional needs. We have a lot of students with mental dis mental um, illness. You know, mental illness really starts to show, you know, when students start to turn 16, 17 years old. Um, that's when um, you start to see some of those uh, manifestations. We have a lot of kids with a cognitive. I know, Joe, you asked earlier, you know, what are we doing to move these kids forward? You know, kids with severe cognitive disability, like our life skills population, are not they're they're not going to get to you know a specific level um, so we have to teach them those strategies and and how to be successful and you know get a job and get to your job and, and take care of business uh, interventions strategies to manage their work and their skills you know that we're trying to transfer them from high school to real life whatever that looks like to them just um, so just so people know uh, 30 per 35 percent of the people in Stratford County Jail do not have a high school education or equivalent. 65 percent of people in the state prison, the same thing. They do not have a high school education or equivalent. It's so important that we do our jobs here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then our life skills program, again, I said this earlier, is growing. We have those five coming up with significant needs for next year to add to our seven. <coughs> the life skills program, so this is Alex Satterfield. So he currently has seven <coughs> students, the additional five, differentiating instruction across the curriculum. Because again, you know, if you walk into a life skills math or English class or, or Alex's um, learning lab, you know, you're seeing um, from students at a third grade level to an eighth grade level. So you want to talk about differentiating when you're having to plan, you know, Patty Beard's got to plan her math around, well, these guys are in pre-algebra, but these guys are learning to add still. These guys are learning on fractions. It's, it's very differentiated. Um, so, um, you know, life skills, we currently have seven kids. We have nine kids in the life skills math program. Um, the life skills cooking, we currently had seven students, and those kids went out um, each week and grocery shop. So not only did they learn to cook, they learned to shop for it, they learned to read the recipe, they learned to cook it um, and present it um, on a plate. Um, life skills <coughs> learning lab, um, which we, this is the first year we've done the double block of that and that's because uh, these are the students who need to get out in the community. They run the school store, um, uh, they do the shopping, they work at the food pantry in downtown Farmington once a month. Um, and then their curriculum this year is focused on the banking, the post office, and navigating the, the coast bus system. So again, Bianca and, um, and uh, Alex work together to make sure that we're not, you know, we're, we're all covering, this, we're not covering the same things with the community. So again, you know, some of the extras, these are just, you know, what your teachers are doing, special ed teachers. <coughs> you know, she's teaching life skills, math, math, English, I already went over that. Matt runs our uh, ski program on Wednesday nights, taking groups, kids up to Gunstock. Dan Chick's teaching um, the after school recovery math class. Um, Alex runs the school story. He helps me coach unified basketball. I coach unified basketball. Um, this year, you guys know we, um, I applied for the Special Olympics grant, so we have our team. Yay. We actually have uniforms. It's very exciting. Um, we've had a pretty good season. Um, 
And then our, lear our learning yes. lab, if you walk into the learning lab upstairs in room 200, we're servicing more kids than ever. Kids are feeling comfortable and confident that they can come in and they trust the special ed department. It's no longer, you know, I've been here six years and, and you know, in the past there was some negative, like they would call it the sped shed or something, you know, and it's not like that anymore. These kids are coming in before school, they're coming after school. Dan Chick had a whole group of kids on a Friday one time working on science. I don't know how he did it, but they were all there working on science on a Friday Was pizza night. involved? <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and they're also coming up to Ice lunch. cream. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of the students don't I have a very difficult, especially sensory issues. They have a hard time in the lunchroom. It's noisy, you know, there's a lot of movement. And they feel very comfortable going up to learn <coughs> lab and saying, hey, can I eat my lunch in here? So um, I get a question. A lot of successes. You, I don't see a Model T or a Model A program. <laughs> Where did that come from? Not yet. Not yet. Joe knows my son. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. So, any any questions? Anything we can clarify? Anything the case manager? No, I'm good. Stan, Joel. Um, yeah. <coughs> Who, and it's probably more of a uh, uh, question for Diana. Who monitors Medicaid billing in the other two buildings? In terms of, well, the, the billing has to be, so for instance, a paraeducator has a grid right. um, where they can say, I've, I've done these services with this student, and then they yeah. select in the grid, okay, it was because this I was helping the student with the, with a speech goal or a counseling goal or, um, you know, OT. Right. So once the paraeducator puts that into the system, what has to happen next is the, the person that, their team leader who could be, Taryn, Taryn Quinn for OT or Lori Arsenal for counseling um, or Kathy Ciros for speech then has to go in check that log and say okay yep that kid is assigned to this person um, as a paraeducator yep they have a speech goal um, and, and sign off on it literally there um, so is that what you do up here no the, the OT and speech do the same thing but I just monitor to make sure the pairs at all times know exactly who's billable because in order to be billable you have to you know have specific some in your IEP so I, I make sure that that list is generated on a regular basis I, I check every Friday okay. to make so sure so my question is who does that for. at the other buildings at the that's already it's it's already kind of in play. I mean, Shonda is an extra kind of double check because <laughs> okay. that's kind of the personality that she is. Um, <coughs> but so, for instance, Darlene and I can go on and make sure that okay, these kids, <coughs> these are students that have all been confirmed, and we're in the process of doing that right now, entering the in the dates for the day that the parents approved um, accessing Medicaid to schools. Um, also, go, we all, I can also see a list of all the people that have IEPs and whether or not it's already been approved. Or is it sitting there waiting for an approval from a parent? Um, is it out of compliance because it's got a little stop sign? Um, so those are all things that, that Darlene and I check check together. And Shonda just has an extra kind of check-in. Because there's such a small population of students at the high <coughs> school that you can see receive reimbursement for. And because it changes more likely, because someone might work their way out of special uh, pardon me out of speech services or OT services she kind of stays on top of that a little bit more whereas the population is more stable at Henry Wilson or at Valley View. Yeah as are mostly counseling. Yeah. And yeah. Um, who typically serves as the LEA to Henry Wilson and Valley View? I know Shonda does it for the high school. I, I am the LEA at Henry Wilson right now and Rebecca's the LEA at Valley View. And Laurel did you have something you wanted to shout out? Well, those services are still being covered. The ser services <coughs> still have to be delivered in terms right. of, you know, you have a certain number of hours that, that each child is required right. to have, right. you so know, the in the IP. Right, so services still being covered, so we shouldn't be losing any billable hours. We, we shouldn't be. Um, right. Okay. We shouldn't be. 
Who is the court liaison for? Um, I, I doubt it is probably. I do much everything of a else. I, and any other thing that's not high school, and some of them that are how high school related, if it's a student that's in an out of district placement or if it's a student that's, we've got an issue in terms of who the district of liability is, I do all those. I do all the neglect cases, I do all the you know, neglect and abuse, delinquency that might be in Henry Wilson or Valley View. So mm -hmm. typically Tuesdays and Thursdays are the afternoons that. I'm in court for a few kids. What's the largest case, the n largest number of students that a one particular special ed teacher at the high school has? In high case school, load? thirteen. Okay. So as I'm cross-referencing, it's interesting. You know, I'm seeing I, I cross-referenced all the all the duties that that are performed in others the other two schools mm -hmm. by the special ed teachers, and it sounds like um, they do a lot of what Shonda does. You do some. You pick up some of the slack, yeah. it sounds like. But it sounds like they do a lot, too. I guess my final question is, um, do the special ed teachers district-wide still all get the special ed stipend for paperwork? To, to the best of my knowledge, mm -hmm. they yeah. do. Mm -hmm. I, I think so. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I think so, right? You guys all? Yeah. yeah. I think so. <coughs> Thank you. Can I share one more thing before I sit down? Yeah. We got a great letter from Oyster River in regards to our unified basketball team this year. Oh, can um, you step to the mic so people oh, can hear yeah. that? <coughs> so we received a letter um, from Oyster River High School, which we played uh, a week or so ago for unified basketball. It says, uh, Dear Principal Jazokas, on behalf of the Oyster River High School unified basketball team, I'd like to thank you and your staff for the, your hospitality and great sportsmanship during our visit to Farmington High School on Thursday, January 28th to play the Tigers. From the minute the team walked through the door of Farmington High School, we were impressed by the warm welcome and professionalism your school offered. It was great to see the cheerleading squad and the band performing, and our athletes were thrilled to experience all the usual components of a traditional high school basketball game. Your announcer consulted with us to make sure the roster we had was accurate, and we appreciate that he went over uh, pronunciations of names to make sure they were correct. Your sound system opted to forego the, the use of the buzzer, which made many of our athletes who are hypersensitive to loud sounds greatly appreciated. Other than the win, the highlight of the visit was the pizza and the beverages you provided for our athletes to enjoy post-game with the Farmington team athletes and staff. The opportunity to enjoy camaraderie and socialization among the players and staff from both schools was something they will never forget. Thank you again for your hospitality and sportsmanship. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It was very nice of them to send that letter. Thanks, Shonda. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, 402, is it? 504. 504. Uh, no, 402. 406. 402, 402. 402, the court, court appointed. 402 is court appointed. Yeah, the court, yes, if a child is court placed. How many placed. do we have of those? And is it going up or down? I mean, it's you know, going I up. We just had another student that wound up, uh, uh, which had nothing to do, you know, it's a home issue. Um, we just had another one. So oh. we have... I can think of two off the top of my head. Three. No, I don't know. Um, three. Another one just moved out of our district. I have three right now. I'd have to go back and look because we did have three. Three out of three. how many out of district? Out of 18. Out of 18. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're holding, holding steady? Yeah. I mean, we, we have one that <coughs> goes out and then one that, you know, comes back in. So. I actually have one more question. I'm not sure anybody here can answer it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Who's the administrator who attends the athletic events at Henry Wilson? Well, I'll answer that. Um, being that we're short on administrators, um, we do as we can. Yeah, we brought you that know, up I mean, a, a week or so ago. I attended, the award, for instance, the award assembly on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, two assistants have gone to events as they can uh, who are helping us to cover so I think we all Cynthia, Cynthia you know to do the dance thank you <laughs> okay good yeah 
I was wondering who, who above and over and above the AD came, but okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. All set, gentlemen? Uh, are we still in? We can move on to financials. Yeah, no, before we get there, I want to get a couple of new business. Well, this is <coughs> everybody else in the world celebrating President's Day today. And here we are. That's an issue. And, uh, you know, and what, what's happening is we lose sight that this is President's Day. We used to have the 12th and the 22nd off in my, in my era. So are we forgetting about our president? We, we didn't even mention it here tonight. That's, uh, that's an issue. Uh, the other issue I keep bringing up is uh, foreclosures. And uh, one of the things you might not know is that the uh, United States is one in 1,278 for every home. Out of 1,278 homes, there's one that forecloses. Okay, that's the rate. Uh, Stratford County is one in 2,481, and Farmington is 100, uh, one, one in, in every 506, 506, which the worst state in the country is one in 553. The best state is one in 18,000 some odd. I venture to guess New Durham's right up there too. New Durham yeah. is, uh, yeah, New Durham is, I think three, uh, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. actually it's worse than ours, which yeah. surprised me because you, they're pretty affluent. But uh, just, just so you know, uh, that's, those numbers are pretty significant. And the last, uh, last month, they increased by 100%, and last year they increased by 100%. So that's, you know, foreclosures. And there was 21 that they show on Realty Track, but that doesn't necessarily it's not show them. Really accurate because a lot of times right. the banks don't for right. actually file their foreclosures. Right. I, matter of fact, I get I get calls sometimes that people, you know, they they're foreclosed. They haven't paid their mortgage in two years, but the bank is reluctant to close uh, to foreclose on them because. They don't. They don't want the property either. I mean, you know, right. an empty building is very hard to heat. You know, to, yeah. to keep track of, to manage. So they just they just hold tight. And hopefully, the economy will get better. So was I, that that was anything else? That's it. That's it. All right. I have one something. Um, at one of our previous meetings, we talked about the possibility of hiring an LNA, but I haven't seen anything posted, and we haven't talked about it any further. Versus a a nurse. We interviewed an LPN and um, didn't seem to be a good fit. We continue um, continue to talk to the hospitals about a contracted service if necessary. Um, you know, both with an LPN or a nursing assistant, there are limitations on what they can do uh, by the nursing standards um, without support. Um, we that search is uh, not exhausted. We continue to try to find avenues. Um, we have an private <coughs> private service for research on LPNs or RNs. We have an interview coming up on Friday. Okay. At what point do we do we expand the search that so we're searching for either a, a an LNA or? A nursing assistant I mean we've looked at an LPN we haven't looked at an LNA um, could you know we posted this on training boards you know okay in the state of New Hampshire state of Maine um, you know, it, it's still something we're trying to turn any stone over to find someone who would be a good fit for us there are people that like the hours and they like the vacations and the summers so they can be with their family and hopefully we'll find someone who either that or you know I'm hoping maybe we can entice the hospitals to have some type of partnership um, yeah. okay we'll see what happens I wanted to respond a little bit <coughs> respectfully to Joe um, yes we don't take today off um, a lot of schools in New Hampshire don't. Um, um, quite frankly, I mean, I 
gotten pressure from the Chamber of Commerce in certain places just because they they don't want us on the slopes the same day or week that Massachusetts or Rhode Island is skiing. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> true too. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it doesn't mean that our students, we try to give them at all levels some exposure to the fact this is a celebration of those people who have held office historically or currently in terms of being a president and what it means and the sacrifice. Um, we keep working on it. No, we don't take the day, you know, because we get, most of our people get next Monday off. You know, that's not President's Day, but it, it's a recognition of that holiday. Um, you know, we will keep working on trying to educate our kids both about the political science of the presidency and the history, because a lot of people have given a lot to this country to make it what it is today. If, if I may, well, what uh, actually was my first vote in overturning the first vote on this board, and that was Martin Luther King Day, so I remember that. <coughs> and one of the things, do we honor the person for, you know, in, uh, or do we not do that? And that's where I'm coming from. And actually that was overturned because this this town has, and you can look at the the magazine that was put out in this uh, 1976 for our 100th anniversary. And one thing that was bothersome was the uh, KKK marching on the South Main Street Bridge, and that's what hap happened to overturn this that that vote. So. Okay. Um. We have financials. Financials. I guess I'll just leave it to you if you have questions or, or <coughs> areas. So, so I have some lines. You'll see a lot. Yeah. There, you'll see some lines yeah. that do have to still have some adjustments made to them. Um, some things that haven't been haven't had a linking where it's workers' compensation insurance, you know, coverage. So we're aware of those and we're cleaning those up um, as we go through the budget. But I mean, essentially, we're going to end in the black. Um, you know, we do have some savings in, in um, staffing, nutrition, um, and fuel, the fuel bid. So um, we're not concerned about that as well as um, Diana is also, you know, we're keeping tabs on, keeping our eye on those out-of-district placements. So at this point, we're in good shape financially. So but, what is um, that budget, the out-of-district? Well, your, your grand total, your, that's yeah, going to be on... this back to back here um, so we're looking at what 938 mm -hmm. just about 900,000 or so is in your out-of-district placements and right now we have about 20,000 remaining unspent 20,000 unspent that's beyond the income what you've been coming right it's not been, not been over and above what it's been right right that can be enough you know, we, we work regularly, you know, <laughs> we all talk, talk regularly about what can be on the horizon. We all know it's an unpredictable. Um, I think some of the data that was shared with you speaks to some of the transitional uh, nature of our community and that we have people coming in and out, so that can change by the day, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. you know, and it depends on the need um, <coughs> of the child. Do you have anything? <coughs> what student dues do we pay at Henry yeah, Wilson? Yeah, that one's one of mine. <laughs> student dues. Um, page 8, line 215. Oh, I thought it was page 6. Um, what would you say? Page eight, eight, line 215 dues. Um, they did at Henry Wilson. There was a spelling bee. Okay. And I noticed that all of our copier um, service agreements are overexpended. Did we talk well, about the that? copier count came in higher than what was budgeted for. Okay, I How we do we track that? that. Um, there's a DocStar 
um, piece of equipment. Um, it's actually a software that's that's tied into the equipment itself, um, and so uh, you know, it counts the copies. It looks at you know what's projected, how many are color, how many are black and white. Um, this billing that we received we're not going to get another billing until the next fiscal year so basically what i have to cover here for any kind of shortage is what it's going to be it shouldn't go any further beyond that and did we move lines around for water and sewer so that they were in in a different spot because those are really um high at henry wilson and the high school um the high school is high simply because uh, because that's for the ball fields that was irrigating all right so that was all the water okay. right yeah. that was doing that was doing that this summer okay um, but it is it is covered elsewhere um, you know Larry and I have just been talking about where we would be covering it from there are other other areas of his budget as far as repairs that he can take from um, we didn't want to jump too hastily and start pulling money out of repairs yet but we okay. know that that is a a negative variance that we've got to and cover. I just have two more are we replacing bus 2 because it looks like we're putting more repairs into bus 2 than we have previously um, I didn't read the page number on that one let's see let me see here where your bus 2 is I guess it's page 26 but yeah Can you tell me the line that you've got there? Because I'm looking I didn't at write repairs, the line down. equipment, not 675. It, it was just, it was a bigger number than what was planned on it. I don't I remember. Insurance of buses. Repair bus to <coughs> um, page 28. Oh, okay. All right. 28 28 yeah sorry. page 28 line 733 yeah um, it is an older bus um, she did have some things that were unforeseen we're, we actually aren't replacing that bus we still have it in you know, we haven't had the word yet to pull it out of commission right but it's not the bus that we're planning on replacing should the Warren article pass um, that uh, that was my ultimate question. The Warren article is for, is it for If the Warren article passes, I think it's yeah. either. I really think it's the older one. It's um, the 2005 48 passenger one, bus number one. Yeah, that was a smaller bus, but it was a is smaller it? bus. Is it? Yeah. Right. Bus two is a full is a full uh, okay. 77 passenger. Alright, and then the last one I had was line 748 um, for the yeah. videographer. Yeah, that yeah. is actually, it's it's basically, um, his position is also um, work that he does in the classroom, and we still oh. have to make an adjustment and charge it out to function 1100. Okay, so. alright, that's all I had. So then, anybody else? ESOL on page 6. Mm-hmm. Is it just because it needs to be switched from a different school? Um, or it's a fifth line let down. Let me see. Fifth, uh, the line number, page six, ESOL is contracted services. Yeah, so how come it's just we're we getting more hours or? I'm looking to see what you're looking at. You mean line 161? Yeah. Okay, so we have twenty four thousand in savings right now. Uh, no, it should be a separate line. I thought it was like it I'm not sure if I no, you, it was uh, like line five. There's twenty five thousand remaining. All right, that was remaining. All right, then that was just maybe it was page right. eight that I was looking at. Never mind. So we're only billing as we go and yeah. and there's a there's a much I think a more finite reconciliation of what we're actually having for services now for ESOL. Because that seems like and wow. We have, three, well, you know, serve, we have three students right. that receive yeah. between you know, up to five hours. Um, <coughs> I'd have to go back and look at exactly. And do you think we'll expend all of that, or? I think we will. Okay. Yeah, my hope is we will. Well, I expect I we'll spend the last next yeah. year. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah, that's all about that. Okay. So, what's your best guess for? 
expended fund balances? Um, I'm not really inclined to, to guess, but that's why I also said that through some areas of, of attrition um, and through fuel, I mean, we're certainly <coughs> safe that we would know that it would be at least $100,000 for fuel. Um, well, that's good. That's, you know, we're working on our, our condition of accounts, um, talking regularly with staff one-on-one -on -one with e each of the buildings to determine what their needs are. Um, that's really where, where I would say at this point. There are some revenues that we still have to cover. So. Revenues? Right. Oh, oh right. Short, We've got short right, revenue. right. Yeah. So that's taken into consideration to balance the budget, too. Okay, so before public participation, I ran into Laura at Irving who <coughs> wanted me to put out there that um, there is going to be a Meet the Candidate Night um, Wednesday, March 2nd at 6.30. Do you know if that's just for school board members or is it all? I believe they're just doing the Meet the Candidate for school board members. Okay. So that would be Wednesday, March 2nd at 6.30 at Valley View. Um, and you can come and meet your school board candidates. Who's running? Who's running? Have you got that? Joel Shagman, okay. Stephen Henry, and Angela Carnell, and Joshua Carlson. Okay. Free. Any public participation? We are waiting for them to get back to us on our last offer. Okay. And Diana, you mentioned you were going to, I think, get back to the program at Henry Wilson that had a one-to-one -one adult student ratio. Behavior lab, I, I forgot the name of the program. Positive behavior lab. That's it. Yeah, there was one teacher and three parents for four students. I think I'm going to explain that some more, maybe. I missed oh. That, <laughs> What I think I said is that, well, one, I mean, the students that require behavior assistance in, in terms of that program or have some pretty significant needs. Um, also, none of the pair educators is being rescheduled at this time, so they're going to go down to um, the special education teacher and then two pair educators. And the one pair educator right now is part, has been part time, not entirely associated with that class. To, to 2.5 is closer, but none of them is being rescheduled at this point. So, so yeah, we'll get it closer to two and a half as opposed to three and a half. Okay, but you're also closer. anticipating dropping a student too. N right, correct. So we'll be at two and a half adults, three students. Right, it hasn't happened yet, but that okay. we expect that it will happen in the course of the look at the services in terms of which students need to have somebody associated with them all the time. Good evening, Agent Cardinal, Farmington resident. When do you expect to hear back? From um, an email from us went to them two days after we met. I'm not sure when the email went, so I'm I'm not sure. I don't have a crystal ball. It's up to them. Well, they didn't say when they would get back to you. You didn't ask. No, we when sent an email. Okay. We sent an email the next day. Um, after we had met and talked over the proposal and we haven't heard back from them. Okay. Um, and then the there's 18 out of district placed special ed students, 204 total. Um, so that, by my math is about 8%. Is that high? 8%? Yeah, when you compare the 18 out of district versus the 204. Yeah, it's higher Latest uh, court action. Of course. So if we take those out, um, so if we go into the 15s, sorry, let me rephrase the question. Is that high in comparison to other school districts? Do you know? No, I mean to the other special education directors. I yes. No, I mean it's part of the issue. I think is a lot of things that are occurring in the right now. Yes. Okay. So yeah. unfortunately, it's, it's not out of the norm right now. Um, okay. But you know we do have one student that was sent out that now is you know. That where he's going to be finishing the program, so you know, there are some that are I mean, happy um, and more quickly than expected. Thank you. Okay. 
Any other public participation? Anything else here from the board for public? Nope. Okay, then I will entertain a motion to go into non-public. So moved. Under session two, RSA 91A32 ABC resignations and nomination. Okay. <coughs> All in favor, Bible? Aye. Aye. I'd like to ask Matt to stay. <laughs> 